Thank you. Uh, as many of you know, this is one of my favorite parts of the board meeting, which is to really to highlight uh, our outstanding faculty. And today I think we have uh, an individual who really exemplifies all the things we want in our, in our faculty. And you'll see he is both a basic scientist who does community-based research and is, and is equally involved in diversifying our graduate student population. He's the whole package. So uh, today's speaker is Irving Vega. He is a Red Cedar faculty uh, uh, member recently appointed and uh, associate professor in the Department of Translational Neuroscience in the College of Human Medicine at Michigan State University. He also serves as the director of the Integrated Mass Spectrometry Unit in the College of Human Medicine as a program director in the NIH-funded Endure Bridge to the PhD program. You heard me talk about training grants yesterday. This is a perfect example. And here he mentors and hosts undergraduate students from underrepresented groups and encourages them to advance toward a PhD in neuroscience. And we've had great success with that. Dr. Vega obtained his undergraduate degree in biology from the University of Puerto Rico Mayaguez campus. He continued his research training in the Department of Cell Biology and Neuroscience at uh, Rutgers University where he earned his PhD. Irving completed his postdoctoral fellowship in neuroscience at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville where he developed his research career focusing on the pathobiology of Alzheimer's disease. Additionally, uh, Irving has been participating in the Academic Leadership Fellows Program over the past year where he's been assigned to me to work uh, 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 as a really, a, it's a leadership development program which I think is one of the most important things we can do which is to really find the next generation of leaders for MSU and uh, Irving is a great example of that. Um, at MSU, uh, Irving's research focus on the, uh, focus, focuses on the molecular and biochemical mechanisms that modulate and accumulate the pathological tau proteins in Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. But he also works on health disparities and is very engaged in the community in Grand Rapids uh, to really engage the community in basic science research. And that's no easy task, and uh, Irving will tell you about that. He's looking at the influences of, of ethno-racial factors on blood biomarkers and Alzheimer's disease, and, and I think you'll be very pleased to hear about his work. So, Irving. Thank you, Dr. Gage, for that introduction and your unconditional mentorship and sponsorship. I wanted to start acknowledging Melanie Coffin for the feedback and the IT uh, staff for the support putting this presentation together. Uh, President Woodruff, more members of the Board of Trustees, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to give you a brief overview. Uh, we don't have two hours, so a brief overview about my research. A principle, I believe, for the scientific endeavor is actually to take knowledge and use it and share it with the community so that we can benefit them and get better health outcomes and empower them for social justice. And using that knowledge in that powerful way, especially taking care of the most vulnerable in our population, it should be what the scientific endeavor should be all about. And that's actually how uh, the Alzheimer's research uh, started. Back in 1901, a patient was brought to a clinic, a psychiatric clinic in Munich, Germany. And that patient was Auguste Dieter. And it was take, it will take care by Dr. Alois Alzheimer, who actually carefully followed her clinical presentation until her death in 1906, where he studied her brain and found, uh, and found two pathological hallmarks that all today we're still trying to figure out what they do. One is outside of the neurons that he called it prax. And this, is, this aggregate is form of, now we know it's form of a, of a peptide of about 40, 42 amino acids. He also found an aggregate of protein inside the neurons and important cells in the, in the brain that he called it bundle of fibers. And today we refer to it as neurofibrillary tangles. And we know that that bundle of fibers is formed of a protein known as tau. The tau protein actually accumulates in a specific brain regions in Alzheimer's disease. And the spread of this pathological form of this protein follow 
the clinical presentation of individuals when it starts in a brain region associated with learning and memory and is spread from that region to other ones affecting behavior until it goes to the areas that erase completely, the pathology erase completely the memory of these individuals, robbing of the dignity of those that live with this terrible disease. So uh, our interest because of tau is not only present as a pathological hallmark in Alzheimer's disease, but in other neurodegenerative diseases, has been to, one, try to understand the pathobiology associated with this aggregation of the protein tau. But also, we have been interested in understand the health disparities associated with Alzheimer's disease. In terms of the um, pathological process, we have been interested in identify and characterize proteins that change their abundance and change post modification changes in the, in the way they are modified in the brain during the course of the disease. And we have used for that a technique called mass spectrometry. And I have been using this technique of mass spectrometry to collaborate with different scientists from identifying the proteins responsible for the barnacles to, to stick to boats and the proteins involved in the regeneration of the sea cucumber gut to human disease. That expertise allowed me also to establish a fee-for-service facility here in the Grand Rapid Research Center called the Integrated Mass Spectrometry Unit, or like we like to call it, IMSU, pun intended. <laughs> and this fee-for-service facility has been able to be in operation thanks to the support of the College of Human Medicine Dean uh, Dr. Aaron Sousa and the support of the chair of the Department of Intellectual Neuroscience, Dr. Jack Lipton, who actually their support allow us in almost five years to contribute, to be in operation and contribute directly to nine published articles, one patent, capture, help to capture over $4.6 million in extra Extra, uh, uh, extra mural research funding. And also, we generate, despite of the COVID-19 that <laughs> almost shut down us completely, generate an average close to $90,000 in income directly because of the services that we provide to the community. That's only on research without counting the, ser counting the service that we provide by do providing workshops to graduate students, undergraduate students, postdocs, and even faculty. I use this technology to, as I mentioned before, to identify changes in proteins associated with the course of the disease, both in animal models and also in post-mortem tissue in Alzheimer's disease. This is one example of the papers that we have published where this protein has been shown that we show that the level of the protein decreases as the disease progresses. And we also did many other studies where we identified that there are antibodies in patients with this, with this disease that it is, goes against this protein. So there is a connection between the level of the protein in the brain and circulating antibodies against this protein. We also were the first one to identify a novel protein called EFHD2, associated with the pathological form of tau, and we have demonstrated that this protein modulates the aggregation of the protein tau. Our graduate students have been actually working in both, trying to understand the physiological role of this protein, but also, importantly so, the pathological role that this EFHD2 protein works. This, this research is important. However, while we are doing this research, currently there are about 6.6 .6 million people living with Alzheimer's disease in the United States. And this doesn't account pro around 30% of people that go underdiagnosed and undiagnosed every year. We expected that by 2025, the percentage of people, the, the percentage of people living with Alzheimer's disease will increase between 10 to 30% uh, depending on the state that you are in. Here in Michigan, it's expected to increase by 15%, the number of uh, people living with Alzheimer's disease from 2020 to 2025 and 2025 is just one, one and a half years from now. So that increase in the, in the amount of individual living uh, with Alzheimer's disease is unfortunately disproportionately affecting uh, people 
based on their sex and their race and ethnicity. We know that women, blacks, African Americans, Hispanics, Latinos, are, are higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and related dementia than whites. And to study that, uh, and to try to find out what are the contextual factors that contribute to that disparity is one of our efforts. I just want to give you an example of a recent, a recent uh, work that we did, looking at what are uh, trying to identify and looking at what actually are the components that contribute to that disparity in, ter in terms of cognitive function between Latinos and non-Latinos white. And in this study, we found that uh, U.S. born Latinos at baseline, this is cognitive function at baseline, they perform worse than Latinos that migrated to the United States when they were younger than 18 years of age, between the age of 18 and 34, and older than 35. And actually, those Latinos that migrated after, uh, in, you know, age in this group of ages, they perform equally or slightly better than non-Latinos white. However, the U.S. born Latinos really perform poorly in the cognitive function, regardless of the domain of, cogni of cognition that we tested, memory, processing, any of the other, uh, so on the other, other cognitive functions that we measure. So this actually indicates that it's not just to be Latinos. It's actually there are other factors that are go to the lifespan that contribute to this disparity among uh, people in our community. While we are in the lab looking at these biomarkers and this pathological process and try to find the next cure for Alzheimer's disease, as a scientist, we usually tend to don't look at all the other factors that contribute to affect the biology that lead to that outcome. And that is equally important as understanding how those molecules aggregate together. And that's actually what has been our work because I call not looking at these factors like the environmental factors, the social cultural factors, the behavioral factors that incide in, in the biology of the individuals. I call that not looking at it. I look at as I, I, my term or the term that I use to refer to it is the vicious cycles of inequality. We need to incorporate these factors in our studies, especially because there are things that we can do. We know that representation in the healthcare system and in research is important for people to get access to it. This is data from the Alzheimer's Association where they illustrate how important it is for individuals to have people that understand their race and ethnicity, their cultural values. Why that is important? Because they are also the ones more at risk of discrimination when they try to assess uh, to get access to healthcare system. As you can see here, the Hispanics, Black Americans, Asian Americans, and Native Americans are more uh, prone to face that discrimination. And usually because they don't see the representation or they don't have representation in the healthcare system, but I will argue that also in research. So what we do for that, we go into the community through a P30 Center grant that funds the Michigan Center for Contextual Factors in Alzheimer's Disease, we go to the community for two goals. One, to bring awareness about risk factors associated with Alzheimer's disease, and also to provide information on health practices or healthy practices for your brain. And we do that in very different ways. We do it uh, completely virtually, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. We do hybrid. We have people connected. We know that even after the COVID-19 pandemic, in order to be inclusive, that Zoom thing stay with us forever. And we also did fully, do it fully in person. One aspect that the community likes is when I bring human, real human brain specimens, and they can actually touch it and actually can see what is happening. I see your faces, and <laughs> I, I know that some of them do the same face like that, but they're lining up, putting gloves to try to touch it uh, and, try, and try to look at it in different ways. And they, they, you can see the sparkle, how that knowledge that was given to them go from short-term memory to long-term memory just because of that experience. We bring 
actually our brain zoo that has brains from salamanders to raccoons to mice to mouse to rats to uh, sheep, monkey, and the, the kids can actually see how the brain evolved through these uh, species. This is actually a truck and tree event in a school in Grand Rapids. And we were just, you know, we were the cool place because we have brains in there, you know. <laughs> but it's also an opportunity for service learning. I bring medical students that are bilingual and we instituted a medical Spanish within a English as a second language course with one of our partners organization, uh, the Roswell Minister, Park Ministry. And in that, the medical students can go, go and introduce term terminology that you can use in a, in a visit to a physician in a Spanish and then the translation in English. And it helps the, the community. The community love that especially because it's coming from medical students. But the medical student can practice terminology in Spanish, number one. And number two, they can practice bedside manners by interacting and getting that empathy with the individuals, understanding the barrier that language possess. So that activity is actually in al aligned to bring awareness, but also about the risk factor, but also about clinical research. We develop a research volunteer directory that oh, today even though people said that it's very difficult to recruit Latinos to, to research, in that directory, in the past five years, we have over 500 Latinos adults in that directory that have helped us to leverage, to bring to town, to Grand Rapids, a longitudinal study to follow cognition of Latinos here in Grand Rapids, which is gonna, it's gonna be done in a different way, not in a fancy building associated with a medical school like this one in Sequia, we're gonna do it inside the community with community partners, with a community clinic. And the knowledge and the training we're gonna provide is gonna stay there beyond the grant and beyond anything that we do scientifically. In addition to increase diversity in research, as Dr. Gage mentioned, I'm the proud director of the Bridges to the PhD in Neuroscience program. And I said that because there's no more fun than being around students that are passionate about and curious about what they wanna do. And we bring 12 students last summer, and this summer we currently have 12 students. And for you guys to know that half of them are in East Lansing and half of them are here in Grand Rapids. And we partner with Grand Valley State University and we are using their dorms. In that way, opening the whole spectrum of research available at MSU to these inspiring neuroscientists. And last year, we have, out of the 12, we have six racing seniors. From these racing seniors, I'm happy to report that Priscilla Coriano was accepted in here at MSU in the Biomolecular Science PhD program, and she wants to pursue a neuroscience uh, research. We also have a Stephanie, a Stephanie and Janilis that were accepted in Puerto Rico in the Ponce Health, uh, Health Sciences System, uh, University, sorry. Uh, Janilis in the, in the PhD in clinical psychology and Stephanie in the department of neuroscience. And Stephanie was actually awarded a fellowship to a T32 grant for the next three year. And she won best award in a natural and conference for the poster that she presented based on the research that she did here in Grand Rapids. Jesus Rosario, another racing senior last summer, now is a ND PhD student at University of Cincinnati Medical School. And Natanya Dennis, who was the first one, a student that we were able to recruit from North Carolina Central University, was made history in that university, being the first student ever from North Carolina Central University be accepted at Yale University in the Department of Neuroscience. So we are very proud of these uh, students. The six, these are five, I know I say six. The number six is actually doing a gap year here in, East, well, in MSU in East Lansing under the mentorship of Dr. A.J. Robinson. And we don't know, we're gonna follow her until she goes to a, a PhD in neuroscience. With that is what I have to say today. I will address, uh, address any questions you may have. so much for inhabiting the ethos of the land-grant professor and certainly as our inaugural Red Cedar Distinguished Faculty Member. Are there questions or comments uh, from the board? Thank you. 
We are so proud of you Great. and your efforts, and uh, let oh, us know. Oh, person. yes, it's your first ambassador. I was just trying to make sure everyone else got there. Thank you so much for this research. I just super appreciate when research that seems like, you know, at the very beginning, I'm like, oh, we're going to have to do a glossary, right? But when you come from this high level into the community, this is the research that we really want to see. And it does fit the land grant mission, but it also fits the human condition, right? And so I just appreciate your work being participatory in that way. Thank you, um, Dr. Gage, for, for having him here. I did want to go back to that one slide that um, talked about, and this is, I think, was the most interesting part of your work is think, not thinking in isolation about these issues, but how there is an ecosystem of inequality that would, and inequity that would, yes, that you called it the vicious cycle, that would, that would contribute to the, um, the effects, the, the um, health effects that minoritized people are experiencing. And I wanted to go back to, uh, oh, food deserts, okay. I wanted to make sure there's one S. It's food deserts, not desserts. Because I have dessert every time <laughs> that I eat. And I was like, oh, geez. So that's food deserts, which is a big deal. But then the other piece was, um, the other piece that I was really concerned about was um, the uh, physical activity. Can you speak more to that? Actually, we just. We just spent a whole week analyzing data surrounding physical activity associated with cognitive function at uh, University of Michigan in a summer data immersion. And it's where we bring people from all the country to work on a specific topic and where this type of research come to as well with biostatisticians, social, uh, uh, social scientists, you know, a very interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approach. Physical activity is associated with the release, for example, of stress. Yeah. And how you can actually uh, trigger these endomorphins in your, in your system that are beneficial for your brain. And how the brain get, get uh, all that release of, co of that bad material for the brain yeah. to our sweat, and then especially to calming down the level of stress that we have during the day. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be that you're training for a, uh, you know, for a marathon. Right? It doesn't have to be that. Just walking every day, just standing instead of sitting, is something that you can do to actually maintain that physical activity, especially when people are 65 years or older. Although, that, that being said, Alzheimer's disease is not a disease of all people. It's a disease that you accumulate the risk throughout your lifespan. Correct. And there are people that have the pathological hallmark of Alzheimer's disease in their brain, but because they had a very good lifespan, they never have clinical presentation. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to achieve. Yeah. I think that's um, the excitement of this research, right? Because listed here is what you can individually do, but systemically what we need to interrogate in terms of the systems that we per um, perpetuate and create that would create the conditions for someone to have their lives um, augmented or um, actually cut short. So I appreciate this more than you can ever know. And your work in the community is to be lauded. Well, Bob, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I was prepared to this question. So oh. actually, I'm going to finish with this. Uh, research usually try to focus on a particular problem. And all of you have seen probably this about equity. And dealing with healthcare, uh, with health disparities about justice, about equity and inclusion. So if we take this one that we all have, have seen before, we look at the, at the problem that is the fence. And we're looking at the fence as the main problem. And we come up with solutions about that because the problem we think is the fence. So with that, we actually put those two boxes and now create a new barrier for that small kid. Have you questioned yourself how that small kid went over, went on top of those two boxes? He made it, but it's a new barrier. So addressing the wrong problem, which actually in this case is to ask ourselves, why these three individuals are not sitting at the breaches? Why are not sitting, why we call it equally just to resolve the problem of the fence and not taking those three out there? We can do that from research through science, and I hope that we can achieve that with the help of you guys here to fulfill the mission of MSU. Thank you. Thank you.